Good evening, everybody. Tonight we have a real treat for you all. Cheryl Campbell, first time author who has whizzed up the best selling list during lockdown. She's already been commissioned to write a second novel. And if you read your Daily Mail, you will have read all about her book on Monday. Today, she's going to tell us all about her exciting life in broadcasting and beyond. Please welcome Cheryl Campbell. Hi, Cheryl. Evening. Lovely to meet you all virtually. <laughs> okay, so let's start off, Cheryl, by you telling us a little bit about yourself. So I've been a member of Hurlingham since the age of five, so that's around 60 years, and um, it's been a huge part of my life since my childhood. So I remember going to the playground when the, the hut was the original hut. I remember having pony rides where the, uh, where the garden people keep all their gardening stuff. And there was a pony and a cart horse and you could go and have a ride on the pony. I remember. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then um, I also used, my mother used to have an allotment because you could have a, somehow have a vegetable allotment, which oh. was up at the top tennis courts by the tennis pavilion. And as oh. a child, I used to help her garden there. <laughs> and um, my father in his, they, my both parents, both my parents lived to in mid nineties. And my dad was known to be driving this black and ivory um, Rolls Royce, which uh, my mother didn't like to wear a seatbelt. So therefore she sat in the back of the car. She was very eccentric and they used to sit. <laughs> and uh, my father also played bridge regularly with the, predominantly the ladies of Hurlingham. I don't think there were so many men <laughs> playing with him. And um, so, yes, my life has been hugely Hurlingham based. And I also went to Madame Vacani's ballet school, where, in fact, I first met you, Janie, oh. when uh, you were a student teacher. And we used to do displays at theatres and also at the Hurlingham Club. And I can remember doing dancing displays in the sunken garden as a child. And one was puppet on a string and uh, after the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> and another was, I think I was a flower fairy or something. And I have videos of you, Janie, still. <laughs> Wonderful. Did, did you, were your children in the dancing displays at Hurlingham? I can't remember. Uh, my children did the Vacani. I don't know. Okay. I think they, they learned ballet at Hurlingham. In fact, yeah. my son never forgets to tell me he did good toes, naughty toes too as a boy, small right. boy. <laughs> I, rem I remember them very well. Um, so what do you do currently? So I've always worked in fashion and um, which we'll come to and the different things that I've done. But for 30 years, I was a celebrity stylist. So when I'm saying celebrity stylist, I don't mean hair. I mean, personal stylist creating, let's call it brand images for celebrities, both on the red carpet and personally and for magazines and TV and their, their public appearances. And doing all of and I stopped doing that a while ago and I now have personal clients whom I help to be the best versions of themselves inside and out from the point of view of their mental, mental self-esteem, um, body image, positive body image, um, um, healthy diet. And pre-COVID in our other lives, the ones we sort of just about remember, I was going into schools and colleges talking about social media, mental health, body image, um, bullying, online and also going into organizations talking about um, how to be uh, best first impressions and what your body language says about you and all that sort of thing oh. and also social media. Fascinating. That stopped during yeah. COVID so I had to reinvent myself. <laughs> okay and did you know you always wanted to work in fashion? Always as a child I used to dress my dolls I was only I was an only child so I, I used to dress my dolls. I used to do fashion shows in the hall with my mother's vintage clothes. My dad used to film, <laughs> used to film them <laughs> as we did them. And um, yes, always, always something to do with fashion. Oh, and I also was, used to draw. You must have had such fun doing all that with your father. It was a lovely thing to do. Um, what was your first Saturday job? So um, before I, when I was still at school, I was, um, I first of all went to work for, a sh I went to work uh, in a shop called Mr. Freedom on World's End when yes. I was, like I was probably 15. And then after that, I then went to work for Smile Hairdressers, which mm -hmm. was in Knightsbridge uh, at, is it called Scotch Corner where um, Scotch House was um, there. And every single trendy, it was the trendiest hairdresser of that time. And everyone from Brian Ferry to Cilla Black 
came in that both for their hair color, their you know their red hair color, as yeah. much as their haircuts. And in fact, the hairdressers then moved on to the King's Road um, on World's End much much later on. Um, yeah. And so then I worked for a shop called Universal Witness on the Fulham Road, which was owned by one of Led's, the band Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And then another Saturday job was Jean Machine, which um, everybody then shopped for their jeans. And yeah. um, you used to earn huge amounts of money there. You were on commission and you nabbed the first customer that came in. And you used to, on a Saturday, you used to, this is a long time ago in the late seventies. I used to come out with about 300 pounds a day. Wow. On commission. I mean, serious. It was, you can imagine how many jeans you were selling for that. And um, the key was to uh, get people to wear them as tight as possible. And particularly the men, the, the men who were working there would get the girls to lie on the floor and zip up the jeans with a coat hanger because wow. you could, it was too tight to pull them together. Yeah, I, I remember those days. Absolutely. I remember lying on the floor of a hairdresser's while he cut my hair straight or something as well. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, but tight jeans was certainly the thing. Um, what was your best fashion job? So when I used to work at Jean Machine, um, I used to tell them, well, that, this was a little while on, that I told them that the clothes weren't that good. <laughs> I don't know why I had the balls to say that, but I did. And um, it wasn't so much the jeans, but I thought they needed to do more than that. And mm -hmm. by this time I was, I was 23 and they said, okay, if you don't think, if you, I was already a stylist by then, so I was using their clothes to style for um, photographs, which is how I'd realized their clothes need to be more than just jeans. They said, okay, you can have two shops. I mean, no one would give a 23 year old this now. So they gave me a shop in Knightsbridge and a shop in Bond Street, FUs, which were the two flagship stores where I basically created the two stores and put, I suppose the first time ever any shops had it wasn't a jean anymore. I could do a colored jean, which matched a t-shirt, which matched a sweater. So you did whole ranges in color schemes. And I also worked with Mulberry where we did um, suede track suits and cowboy belts and bags and, um, yes. <laughs> and worked in Hong Kong as well to bring the stuff over from Hong Kong. And everything that was successful in the two flagship stores then went into the other 50 shops. Oh, how wonderful. You really traveled as well. So how yes. celebrity celebrities always been in your life in some way so my parents were if anyone actually knew my parents they will realize that even in their old age they were always extremely glamorous and um we they uh, used to go to all the the smartest possible restaurants of the era from the 50s 60s onwards ranging from the priest le coup de france white elephant on the river all those places and all those places had celebrities sitting in them from the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, to Gulbenkian, to anyone you could possibly think of was there to be seen. And so I used to, as a child, sit there with my pencil and paper in the, in, as an only child on my cushions in the restaurant mm -hmm. um, while uh, all these celebrities were eating um, around us. So that was the first um, chance of seeing celebrities. Oh, and really? my dad also was a timber importer and he supplied the, t the film studios and the TV studios. And he used to take me to Pinewood Film Studios. So he used to supply the timber for the set. So for example, if it was James Bond, he'd take me to the James Bond set. And I met Roger Moore, I met Cliff Richard when he was doing the movie Summer Holiday. And so I have an amazing autograph book from that time. So unfortunately most people are dead. And um, when I was at, even when I was at school, my very first school, and I remember, I was. I was quite cute then. I don't know what happened, but it was a long blonde hair somehow that was obviously made me cute. And um, I, the, um, the headmistress brought me out in front of the assembly when I was probably five years old and said, right, I'm going to introduce this little girl to, um, it was Judy Garland. Oh, wow. So I met Judy Garland when I was five because she was about to, she was looking at the school for uh, Lorna Luft to go later on. Oh, wow. That's, that was lovely for you. Um, what was the first pop concert you ever went to? So the first one was the Beatles, and I was probably nine or ten, and it was at the Hammersmith Odeon. And uh, my parents, I went along with my parents, I've still got the programme, and um, we were sitting there, and you couldn't really hear the music because the girls, the teenage girls, were screaming so much. And then oh, all yes. I remember so vividly was that my mother go, right, we're leaving now. And I couldn't understand why. And it transpired that Paul McCartney had said, or John Lennon said, they liked Jelly Babies. 
And so the girls were throwing jelly babies at the stage. And my mother felt that these were missiles that were going to kill us or kill me as her only darling child. So I was removed. Oh, what a shame. That was best fun, I should think. <laughs> <laughs> How did you first start in styling? So having always worked in fashion, I went to a place called the College of Distributive Trades where I learned fashion design, uh, buying, window display, uh, history of fashion, um, everything you could do to, everything you would need to know to have a shop or work in fashion in some way. And um, I hated working in shops and I did. I worked for Jeff Banks and I worked for the warehouse and I did lots of different learning about standing in a shop and serving. However, which was fine when I was doing the G machine as I was a Saturday girl, but when it was suddenly your proper job, it wasn't my thing. And the manager said to me, you really hate this. And I said, yeah, I really do. She said, okay, why don't you do the windows? And uh, so I started doing the windows for the warehouse shops, made doing their displays. And she said, you're really quite good at this, better than standing in a shop. Why don't you go and be a stylist? So I said, what's a stylist? Nobody was a stylist then. This was just right. the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. And she said, a stylist is someone who goes and shops for someone else with their using their money. So I said, this sounds good. A good idea. <laughs> Going to go and be a stylist. But you needed to belong to a union to be a stylist. And it was literally a closed shop. So the only way you could be a a stills photography stylist was to belong, belong to uh, an, um, a union called AFAP. So I tried them. And the very first job they ever gave me was for American Express, where I had to go down Bond Street and collect all these very smart paper bags, you know, the ones that stand up on their own from Chanel and Gucci and Christine yeah. Jewel. So I collected these bags, I had to do a still life with the bags. And then the second part of the shoot for American Express was there was a restaurant in Knightsbridge called Mr. Chow. Yeah. And because Mr. Chow's took American Express, uh, that was a styling, the model and her supposed boyfriend with beautiful clothes. So that was my first ever styling job. And getting into commercials, again, you had to be um, part of a union. So the only way I could get into doing costumes, wardrobe, that side was to actually go in through doing interiors and set design and I wangled sideways in. Oh, well done. It sounds like you're very enterprising. Um, what was the most fun styling job you've ever had? So my best friend at school was a girl called Cotty who just happened to be Michael McIntyre's mum. Oh, wow. I love Michael McIntyre. And um, so Michael McIntyre's dad was Ray Cameron, who was the producer and director of the Kenny Everett TV videos and Naughty videos. And um, so I got to know Kenny and obviously through Cotty and we um, worked. So I then became the person that created a whole lot of Kenny's costumes. And I don't know if anyone watching remembers, um, it's when, when you do, I won't do it, I'll do it with my arms, all in the best possible taste. That were my leg, that would be my legs when Kenny flicked his legs round and then, and then he was, um, it's good, I have to be careful how I say this, the, the, when he did the legs, he was called, no, I won't say it in case I say <laughs> it wrong. <laughs> um, and also there was um, all different characters. There was Sid Snot and the Australian with corks around his head. And it was really fun. He hated dressing up, hated it. Well, wow. I complained, <laughs> but he was very shy, really shy. Really? Oh, she don't know these things. And what was, the, what was the most iconic star styling job you had? So when I was pregnant with my son, um, so uh, I was asked to do Ringo Star, which was super exciting, being that was the first ever concert I'd ever gone to. And uh, so his uh, management told me to go to his house, which was in Windsor. So I went to his house, which was this amazing, huge country pile and um, went in and he said, right, um, we have to do clothes that I that are now you need to make for me back to the 60s. So like Beatles suits, which I needed to have made by Savile Row tailors and the rest. He said, right, I'm going to go and take you to where I keep all the old Beatles clothes, which was in some sort of folly at the bottom of the garden. Mm -hmm. And it was like going into a wonderland of all the Sergeant Pepper's old clothes, all the Maharishi stuff, oh, all the boots with um, sequins, um, mirrored sequins of that era. And um, it was literally everything I'd grown up with suddenly in reality. 
and I was flown first class, as you do, to the Bahamas <laughs> um, to shoot. And he was with Barbara Bach. This was actually the time when he was before he'd gone into rehab. Um, this was his his not his great time. However, he was amazing. He did the job. It was for a, an American commercial called Sun Country Wine Cooler, which was uh, like a spritzer. Mm -hmm. we, I never saw the Bahamas because we were in the studio all the time. Could have been anywhere. Could have been in Clapham, Croydon, anywhere. And um, at the end of the shoot, all the crew got together and started singing Beatles songs together with him, which was the weirdest thing singing Beatles songs with what the person you've grown up with from a child and he'd, I'd even collected I don't know if anyone watching who was old enough to remember collecting cigarette cards when you either collected yeah. the monkeys or the Beatles yeah so um that was weird oh gosh well that must be wonderful. was his house wonderful as well yes it was I think it was it um was sold in the end to um it was called Tittinghurst Tittinghurst something like that yeah Yes, I remember that. Yes. And um, what was the most demanding job you've done? The most, well, I did commercials for a long time and they always expected everything yesterday. And one of the ones which, where they expected me to do something literally yesterday was for British Rail, Network Rail. And they said, right, no pressure here. We want a hundred tap dancing, um, tram, uh, what do you call it, um, commuters wearing pinstripe suits, all the same, same. And matching ties in 24 hours. Wow. And uh, they were all tap dancing across Waterloo Station. And in fact, all of these old commercials are still on my YouTube channel. Oh. Tap dancing across Waterloo Station. Oh, that must have been fantastic. <laughs> and what was the most secretive of all the jobs you've had to do? So I used to get asked to do really weird jobs, some fabulous and some weird. And the weirdest one was when I was rung up and it was by, I think it was by the Daily Mail, one of the newspapers said, right, we've got a story and we can't tell you who it's about, but it's one of those secretive, you know, tell all things. Uh, we need you to go to wherever it was. I don't know where it was, Chiswick House, somewhere like that. Um, and you had to get clothes for this very beautiful girl. So I called in all these clothes. I just had sort of the sizes. I called in favors, turned up there. I, I was it was I was virtually blindfolded and turned up there. And I don't know if anyone will remember, but there was Andrew Neal, who is now is still a news person on TV. He'd had an, a, a, an alleged, I'm going to say, affair with a hooker, alleged hooker, uh, who worked at the House of Commons called by Pamela Bordes. So there was the problem that he there had been secrets that should not have been shared in in the uh, bed. So anyway, so it was a tell-all from about Pamela Bordes, who I take got all these designer clothes from. And the designers were really, really cross with me because they didn't want to dress her. And the worst bit of all was that oh, there was a horse. For some unknown reason, she was going to lead a horse. So this horse appeared, and I had to put her in jodhpurs, which I borrowed, all to go back to the shops and the designers. And um, she was someone who didn't wear underwear. Oh no. Which is not a good thing when you're borrowing clothes from shops. And she had no concept of the fact why she should be. <laughs> How funny. And who was the biggest diva you dealt with? So I can now I can now say this because I'm no longer styling celebrities, but probably the, the 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 one who was certainly tricky was Jane Seymour. I went I went to stay down in Somerset to her most beautiful house. Uh, where they shot the, the Jardin and the Max Factor, which was a perfume, and um, where I was doing all these beautiful floaty clothes for the perfume. And let's put it, she doesn't suffer fools gladly. That's I what I will say. <laughs> but she's very beautiful, and the yeah. house was extraordinary. Oh, lo lovely. I love houses. Um, you styled Zara Tyndall when she was in her 20s with the jockey Richard Johnson. How did you meet Zara? So I used to, um, so as part of all my styling, I used to be the person that created ideas um, for OK and Hello, not at homes ever. Um, I used to come up with concepts, just sell in and then interview the celebrities, um, styled them, created the shoot and then sold, I owned the whole project. However, so I never did it at home. So they said, we want you to do it at home. And I went, oh, I don't really do that. They went, no, no, I think you might want to do this. It's Zara, Zara. 
as in, um, it wasn't Tyndall then. And um, we want you to go to Gloucestershire. And in fact, the cottage where it was shot was borrowed. And uh, we need you to bring hose to make it look clothes for her to look homely, you know, at home, nice cozy sweaters to sit in front of the fire. And um, so we got on like a house on fire. She's very straight talking, down to earth, normal. And uh, we got on so well, I then became her, let's call it her unofficial stylist for quite a few years after that. And the first job after that, she called me and said, right, it's Williams. I think it might've been his 21st birthday, which the theme was out of Africa at Buckingham Palace. Ooh. So um, I had to dress her in, um, I don't remember what it was now, but it was something to do with safari, her and Richard. And then after that, um, the palace was also working with me when it was ever royal, properly, she had to look properly princessy and royal for royal engagements where uh, I do beautiful gowns. And then the one which uh, came unstuck because she was always a bit of a rebel. Um, I was dressing for, I dressed her for Ascot quite a few, a few times, a few years over, but she always wanted to wear something that I hadn't suggested. And I brought this dress, which was nothing to do with Ascot, but it happened to be one shouldered and it had a bit of a slit. And I said, you can't wear that for Ascot. She said, of course I can. And we all went, you really can't. You're supposed to have your shoulders covered and it's to your knees. No, 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 no problem. So I said, I'm going to sew up the slit. So I sewed up the slit. I made the dress sit better on her shoulders. She, um, she wore it, and of course, you, we all know what photographers and the press are like. The moment she hit Ascot, the photographers were shooting up skirt. So <laughs> the slit, she also slit the slit more. So um, the slit was fully to her thigh. It was <laughs> off the shoulder, and I got a barrage of would you dress? How could she dress? How could Zara go to dress? How could Zara go to style? I can't speak. How would Zara go to Ascot dressed like this? Oh my God, that was and very good. still being mentioned because there was a program the other day on Zara, the 21st century royal, and her mother, Princess Anne, and the clip of her in the dress from Ascot came up saying she was always a rebel. Oh, so wow. like addressing someone famous as, as I have many times, whatever you put them in, even if it wasn't actually you at that time, you are still by association. So a lot of times when it wasn't me, I couldn't defend and say anything. You no. just to um, suck it up. Suck it up, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and what was, your, what was your most exciting moment? So when I was styling her, I went to um, I went to everywhere. So where she lived in Gloucestershire, to her house there, to Princess Anne's house, to St James's Palace and Buckingham Palace. And it is sort of exciting when you're usually just driving past Buckingham Palace, sitting in the traffic, to actually be waved in. I know you've been there too. To be waved in past the guards, given a parking space, and uh, it's actually full of offices. Once you're in there, it's actually not that exciting, but it's exciting to look out at the change in the guard from inside. You can imagine what it's like standing on that balcony. So that was pretty cool. And that was when I was doing a whole lot of her um, Ascot stuff. And she only ever gave me a few minutes to do everything. It wasn't like I could ever properly pre-plan. It was always like, well, what this now, yesterday. <laughs> As everyone does. Yeah. Well, the horses is. are more important than the dresses for her. Of course. Um, what was your funniest moment? So when I was styling her, because she used to sort of start off, be there, and then she'd disappear, um, me and the dress designers um, that I'd called in that we were doing the fittings for, um, we, were, we were there after her, and it was in Princess Anne's apartment. And uh, when I went to leave, I realised that all the offices had closed, and actually couldn't get out, I was locked in, which uh, could be worse places to be locked in because there is actually a swimming pool out there <laughs> as well. <laughs> but to find your way out is quite an interesting thing where there's actually no one to ask. Yes, it's huge. I mean, I remember it's just corridors and corridors. It is corridors and corridors. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and some very shabby furniture in some of the apartments too. Yes. <laughs> Not what you expect at all. So how did you end up with a million pounds worth of diamonds in your bed? So one of the, the, the events where, I, where Zara was told to wear her, you know, look princessy, and I was not allowed to do anything other than look, make her look princessy, was for the uh, royal premiere of the film Seabiscuit. And I went to uh, St. James's Palace, and I borrowed a million pounds of diamonds. I hadn't specifically borrowed a million pounds of diamonds, but somehow I'd come to that. 
which obviously were insured, not by my insurance, and um, got addressed. And Princess Anne, um, her, sorry, Tim, Commander Tim Lawrence, and um, Zara and I, um, and obviously um, ladies waiting in security, we all piled in the royal cars and went across. We had to, for some reason, we had to walk across Leicester Square altogether because the cars dropped at this to the outside. Went to the premier and then came out and, and there was a drinks thing afterwards. And then Zara said, right, take the diamonds. And I went, I can't take the diamonds. <laughs> I mean, can I not collect them from you tomorrow? At least you're in a, you know, you're staying in somewhere pretty safe guarded. She said, no, 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 I don't want them. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to put them in a Sainsbury's bag, as you do. That's right, <laughs> of course. All this million pounds of diamonds in the taxi with me in the bag and sleep with them under my bed. I was wow. terrified I was going to be mugged. Yes, that must be very funny, especially when it's not yours. Oh dear. Yes. <laughs> what was your strangest personal styling job? Um, my strangest one was probably a, one of the Saudi princes who had um, gained about 20 stone. He actually, when he showed me pictures of what he looked like a few years before, he was really slim and good looking. And he was seriously, he was in the 20 something stone. He could hardly move. Anyway, so he wanted me to help him diet which was never going to happen because he was too interested in his food. And um, he wanted to win the heart of this Lebanese pop star um, who he had the hots for. So the idea was that I slimmed him down, dressed him to look sexy and fab so that he could win the heart. And his family were really anti, anti this Lebanese pop star because he was indeed mm. one of the royal princes. I mean, quite high up. So um, he did everything he could to woo her. He, he bought her diamonds. He flew her everywhere. And, to, and I, I was dressing him all the time in, in, we would go shopping and I'd go, this it would still be a nice color cashmere sweater. He said, right, I'll have 10. And we're not talking a cashmere sweater that's 50 quid. We're talking one that's 500 quid. And this was like every day there'd be thousands of pounds spent and he'd pay me in 50 pound notes, which was quite exciting. I'd never seen so many. Anyway, as time went on, he said, right, um, she's coming to London. I'm flying her here and we're going away. So this very pretty Lebanese pop star, who was very famous in her own country, appeared at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. I got his whole wardrobe together. He had Filipino staff who had itemized literally every single <laughs> bit of clothing he was going to wear for his sojourn with her and polaroided it so that he would know what to wear with what. Oh, I forget to add that in the meantime, he'd would get his Filipino staff to ring me at one or two in the morning and say he doesn't, he's just about to go out now, he doesn't know what to wear. And I'd have to tell the Filipino staff what would go, what shirt would go, what trousers and what shoes. Uh, this is what happens when you're you're paid a lot by a Saudi prince. Anyway, so I turned up at this, the, the penthouse suite at the Mandarin Oriental, and he had filled this suite with Moyes and Stevens flowers. Literally, I have never seen so many flowers. They were there for a little while. The plane, the private jet, as you do, was waiting where it was, where it was or wherever it was. And the staff kept saying, we need to leave, we need to leave. And the, you're going to miss your slot. And he had no, no sense of time at all. They eventually they left. He went, just take all the flowers, take what you want. So I went back in his taxi and we tried to pile as many flowers in the taxi out of the windows. It was like sitting in Kew Gardens in the taxi. <laughs> Good thing you're going to have hay fever. <laughs> He, he oh, did actually in, get engaged to her, and then his family made him break it off. Oh, what a shame. Oh, well, there you go. And what was the most fun styling job or photo shoot that you went on? So, um, the one of the most interesting was that I was asked to style, I did a lot of sports people, more than models, um, as well as actresses, and I styled all the Wimbledon tennis players, so the WTA tour. So I did it for about three years running and each year they'd know I was doing it and you could never know which tennis players were turning up because it was according to how their matches would go. So I'd get these really glamorous evening dresses ready for them and then they'd roll up. Anyway, so one was in Eastbourne, not so exciting, the women's <laughs> match there. Uh, one was in Rome where we stayed at the, Has I think it's a Hassa, Hassler on the Roman steps, which was pretty fab. And then the, the best one was the one in Berlin where um, I had everyone, all the tennis players. And the one I really, really wanted was, um, oh, um, I've forgotten her name, uh, 
So, uh, what's a really pretty, beautiful girl? Uh, Kornikova? Yeah, Anna Kornikova. And she wouldn't do it, but she would never agree to do anything because she had this huge posse of Russians surrounding her, telling her what she could do and couldn't do. However, she saw the Polaroids from the other players each time they came back from their pictures because this was beautiful. I think I used Etro evening dresses. Again, huge amounts of diamonds with a guard. This time Annie had a gun. Um, anyway, she rolled up with a whole Russian posse in uh, nylon shell suits. This was the sort of Vicky Pollard look at the time. Um, if you know what I mean, Little Britain, Little Vicky Pollard. Anyway, so they all turned up in their shell suits straight from the tennis and her sports bra. <clears throat> and um, I had to put her in this beautiful gold sort of lame dress, which she loved. And she kept on going, more boob, more boob. So she only had a sports bra. <laughs> so I was staying in the hotel. So I went and borrowed one of my bras for her, which is completely the wrong side, but it gave her huge cleavage. So um, she was really happy with that. And then she said, more, more, more. So <laughs> we created this extra cleavage, which then I was unaware of this and probably she didn't care. She was also the face of Triumph Bras mm -hmm. and her management nearly had a seizure that suddenly <laughs> she could be seen in this dress with this huge amount of cleavage. <laughs> it had to be um, photoshopped out because it was against the whole... Um, protocol of what she was advertising for triumph oh gosh a lot of legalities before they were allowed to use that shoot oh dear <laughs> but you never know what's going to happen on your shoot you have no. diamonds you have guns you have security guards and what? um often um i shall i shall answer this question before you might come to it so on a, on a commercial you also have um i was on a shoot where it was soap stars and um, un unexpected things happening. And it was soap stars from all different soap operas meeting together. And um, one of the actresses was quite stiff and uncomfortable and nervy. And the photographer said, have a drink. And we always had an agreement that no one should ever drink because when you're doing a photo shoot, the, the models get glassy eyed. Anyway, yeah. she peaked way too soon. And um, it was virtually impossible to shoot after that. Anyway, she seemed to be getting on terribly well with one of the actors, who in fact she'd been very rude to when she first arrived. Anyway, the taxis turned up to collect everyone. She could not be found anywhere. We thought she'd already left. We thought he'd left. The caretaker found them in flagrant, flagrante in one of the room cupboards. <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen on any shoots. No, well, that's what makes it so exciting, doesn't it? Uh, did you enjoy presenting the BBC Royal Ascot fashion coverage? I loved doing that. So we had five days of wearing fabulous outfits, which were all specially given, designed for you, because obviously you're, you're, you're quite up there. Um, and I was working, and you'd go and interview anyone you wanted. And at that point, you had an earpiece as well with the director telling you to go and talk to that woman and he'd go with that hat that looks like a bird's nest. There's someone screaming in your ear going, the hat that looks like a bird's nest. And you actually realize it's actually a sort of 750 pound Philip Tracy. <laughs> and you can't say, you have to say, that was a beautiful hat. Where did you get it from? And you know, how long did you take to get your outfit together? And then I was also interviewing Ivana Trump and Neil Armstrong and Shirley Bassey and um, oh yes, it was really interesting because it was it was everybody in the royal enclosure, and um, it was such it was really fun for five days. And God, your feet hurt at the end. <laughs> Wonderful. Was that your best TV presenting job? Uh, no, probably my best one was being at the royal wedding of Kate and William, and reporting oh. back on the guests' fashions um, for Radio Two. That was amazing because uh, to be actually there. Um, with all the other reporters and watching and being there at the time and watching the whole um, wonderful procession and pomp pageantry, it was quite a special moment. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. It was wonderful. And also the other thing I was asked to do, I sort of seemed to be at that point the title of royal commentator. So I used to get asked to do all sorts of things talking about the royals. And um, I also did a whole thing on Kate style for American TV. And um, I still seem to have that title as role commentator. And the last one I did, which I shall gloss over, was before we had Megan Gate. Um, 
and they were still, um, let's call it a little more popular. I was had to talk on all her clothes on the Royal Tour when they did Australia and New Zealand, which is actually quite interesting because I had to do huge amounts of research on it. And it transpired that without exception, every single outfit down to each shoe was considered and had a uh, mission statement within it without, there was nothing that was unthought of, very considered. Gosh, that must have been a huge job to do. It was, that was for ITV. So um, it was interesting. No, we, we go from this very exciting career to another exciting career. You had, a, you had a shop on Parsons Green. So my life has always followed the progress of sort of what was going on in my personal life. So my children were small and I thought, I really don't want to keep on going away filming, being away from them. I'll have a shop. So I, obviously I'd had retail before and that was my training. So I thought, I'll do a children's shop. So at that point, uh, Trotters was just opening and... Um, uh, I always wanted to do a children's emporium, so I did. And I opened a children's emporium on Parsons Green, um, literally on Parsons Green opposite where, um, what used to be A King, what's it called now? Fresh and, not Fresh and Wild, um, 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 the, the really posh food shop on Parsons Green. Oh yes, Bailey and Sage. Bailey and Sage, bang opposite Bailey and Sage. It was A A King then. And um, I used to go in because I used to buy masses of children's clothes in those days. <laughs> so it was called Kids on the Green and it had a brontosaurus. It was a green front and it had a brontosaurus on the front. And when I look back, I didn't realise quite how successful it was. So I ran it with my Chinese manageress. And in fact, my nanny, when she wasn't looking after the children, would come and be also my other manageress and run the shop. Anyway, sometimes it got really busy. And one day... I saw some men with walkie-talkies and I thought, this is strange. Why are they on their walkie-talkies? And then I saw a woman with red hair and two small children. And I didn't really take much notice. And they were literally picking up armfuls of clothes. I mean, literally everything in the shop and piling it on the counter. I thought, this is exciting. And then suddenly I realized that it was Fergie, Duchess of York, oh, uh, yeah. with her children, which is why there was her, her security detail with her. And suddenly I have never seen so many people in that shop at once. Obviously, people who realized who she was and were come in and to have a look. Anyway, she paid very quickly what she thought was the correct amount and left. The security men whisked her out. And the next, and then when my managers and I totted up the bill, it was way out, it was hundreds less. <clears throat> so I thought, what do I do? I can't let you know, this, this go. How do you ring Buckingham Palace? I thought to myself, sorry. <clears throat> so um, I thought, director inquiries, so I got the number for Buckingham Palace, rang through, and um, I went, uh, hello, can I speak to the Duchess of York, please? And they went, uh, who's speaking? So I said, well, she's just been in my shop, and this is Kids on the Green, and Cyril Campbell, and um, no problem, they went. And they put her, hi, <laughs> she asked the phone, and I don't really know how to say this, but you had to leave rather quickly with all your booty, you know, the ballet shoes and the tutus and the dresses, and um, it wasn't quite all paid. <laughs> no problem, I'll send you the check. <laughs> I think that's lovely. So she was generous anyway. That's amazing. Very, yes. <clears throat> now we get to the most important thing at the moment. What gave you the idea for your book, Secrets in the Dark? Well, I'm going to start by the premise, the book is not me. Lots of people have asked, is it me? So, no. <laughs> it, the premise of the book was always going to be the story of a celebrity stylist and it was going to the idea, original idea was going to be a bit like um, this, the movie Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, where Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and the uh, assistant took over her life. However, the book, as the characters evolved, the book evolved and it didn't. So the book became this story about two girls uh, set in the 70s, between the 70s, 1970, 1980. Um, and what happens to a friendship where everyone has secrets and the secrets overtake their friendship because they don't want to tell, tell anyone what awful things have happened to them. And um, they're, they're, the things that happen to them change the courses of their lives and um, take them on a roller coaster ride from the, new, from the King's Road, Chelsea, to uh, Paris, Los Angeles, south of France. <laughs> uh, very sort of glamorous locations, but there's also the dark side as well, because they both go through various traumas. 
Um, and I thought I'd read you a little extract here. That would be great, thank you. So the story is um, about two protagonists, Phoebe, who's the poor little rich girl, and Paula, who's the girl from the wrong side of the tracks. And um, this is Paula, this, this is a chapter on Paula, 1970 to 1971. A woman in a nurse's uniform appeared from the inside of the building and surveyed her new arrival with cold, uncaring eyes. Eyes that had seen so many unmarried pregnant girls like Paula arrive and leave from her establishment for years now. Good morning, Paula. I'm Matron Mary. Paula looked at the woman and didn't feel a single kindly vibe emanating from her, only cold clinical efficiency. Follow me, please, and I'll give you a quick tour. You'll need to know where everything is as you'll be living with us for the next few months until the birth. The matron's words echoed around the dark wood panelled hall interior, which smelt strongly of fresh furniture polish. Paula instantly knew that this particular smell would always remind her of the moment she'd walked in here for the rest of her life. She followed uncharacteristically meekly after the woman, climbing the steps of the grand sweeping mahogany staircase to her new future. She felt like she'd she felt like she time traveled and was no longer in the 1970s, but somewhere back in Victorian times. The matron strode purposely on ahead, her sensible flat lace up shoes squeaking on the shiny polished parquet floors. She finally stopped at huge double doors and with some effort pushed one slightly ajar. This is our recreation room. The matron waited for Paula to step forward and have a better look. Paula peered over the woman's shoulder through the half open doorway where she could see a group of girls in various stages of pregnancy sitting around a long trestle table strewn in magazines and coffee mugs. Some girls were smoking and others drinking and chatting, but they all had the same distracted and disengaged look in their sad eyes. They all looked up as one and glanced towards Paula at the open door. Paula tried smiling at their direction, but they all looked back down as quickly as they'd looked on and returned their attention back to wherever they'd begun doing. Maybe friendliness wasn't allowed here, Paula thought to herself, but she'd just become one of those women now and they didn't look as they were filled with too much joy, laughter or hope. Suddenly she felt properly scared of what her future may hold. Meanwhile, Matron had marched on ahead of her on a mission to finish this newest inmate's tour as quickly as possible. This is the dormitory and this is your bed. Paula looked aghast at the narrow cot bed with the two worn blankets, blankets folded in a pile on the end of it. She thought back to her lovely comfy double bed in her own bedroom at home with all her pop posters on the wall. She wondered how her life could suddenly have been so quickly reduced to this all from one stupid pill not working. Right, now you've seen everything, you need to come with me for a medical check for any venereal diseases. Matron's instructions were delivered in a voice so devoid of any warmth or feeling that Paula wondered if she'd been born this way or had this grim and grey foreboding building molded her into this grim and grey cold and heartless person. Paula looked at the person, at this woman in horror. Why would she have anything wrong with her? She was simply pregnant. Girls like her didn't get diseases down there. How much worse could this get? She'd learnt how to be resilient and keep the peace from living with her dad and his drunken mood swings. So she prepared for whatever was thrown at her in, the dismal and in this dismal and depressing place. She knew that it would be easier to keep doing exactly as she was told until it was the right time to reassess the situation. And now wasn't the time. She needed to have the baby first. She decided there and then she wouldn't argue or be combative. If it meant someone checking her girly bits, then she'd have to suffer it. She quickly learned how to survive there. No one bothered to talk to her, even though she tried to talk to them. Maybe it's because all the girls knew that this place was simply a transitory moment in their life, a miserable memory to be discarded as soon as possible. So by trial and error, she quickly discovered that she needed to get up every day at seven o'clock for breakfast after a quick wash at the communal basin separated only by modesty partition screens. To keep her sanity, Paula quickly realised that she needed alone time to think, so she readily tried to book a weekly bath in one of the in the one and only tub. It was the one time she could ever get away from the other girls. The matron made it very clear that Paula's daily chores were both her penance and payment for being looked after there, together with the Sunday church visits. As a Catholic girl, she'd been happy going to church when her mum was alive, but that had stopped soon afterwards. She wondered why God could have been so cruel to have taken away the person she loved most. 
Paula wasn't sure what God was doing much at all to look after her now, as the chores given to her were all really hard, but she was strong and healthy and hardly showing even at seven months. So she set to work without grumbling. She scrubbed floors and stairwells and fetched buckets of coal or water with others during the same. Even on the day they went into labor, Paula had read enough books to wonder if she'd returned to Dickensian times and had to, had to pinch herself every so often as reality check. But she kept reminding herself it wasn't forever. The moment her baby was born, she'd be gone. She tried to imagine how she could escape to go and live somewhere with her baby, using her meager savings to start off with. She was sure that she'd managed to squirrel enough, away, enough to keep them going for a few weeks until she could find a job of some sort. She had to keep positive and keep her dream alive. Thank you. That's good. I mean, that, that was some... As I read the book, as you know, so I read all that. It was very sad, very sad and that it could happen in those days, really bad. I was um, shocked because I didn't even realise that that was the 70s and it was still happening. Yeah, I'm sure certain things are still going on today. Um, is there any part of Secrets of the Dark that are you? I mean, are you Phoebe? <laughs> so Phoebe is five foot two, redhead, quite dumpy, curvy, and with lots of wavy well, red, very wavy red hair. And um, I'm five foot six, blonde, um, not so dumpy. <laughs> um, I also, Phoebe was very unloved by her parents, very unwanted. And um, I was a very much wanted child. My mother had multiple miscarriages to even get to have me. I was the very much wanted child. Hence, I was went everywhere with them. So, and very much loved and overprotected, if you like. So, and Phoebe was properly unloved and uncared for and literally poor little rich girl who no one cared for, apart from um, Mrs. Abbott, the housekeeper, who was really her mummy. Yeah, so, uh, no, it's, um, no, definitely not. However, as uh, I suppose I can call myself an author now, um, when you write, you take things that you've seen in real life uh, not necessarily lived. I was never raped. I shall say that to I as well. I've never had drugs problems, um, nor have I had mental health problems. There's a lot of, um, and uh, coercion, um, relationship coercion. God, it sounds a bit dark, the book, but it isn't all. Um, there is trauma in it. And I have not had, I've been lucky enough to have a really quite blessed and privileged life. And so no, but I did see a lot of things. I was a Deb. Oh. A debutante. So uh, when Phoebe is a Deb, I obviously could take my own experiences as a Deb and all the amazing houses and parties and balls I went to. And indeed, I look, I still have all my Deb diaries. So I did check back at things I might have done. I you did. Don't, um, don't, sorry, regret, don't regret being a Deb then. You enjoyed that. It was amazing then. I was never there to find a husband. Neither was Phoebe. But you, you, know, you the experience of, of going then, it was like another world of the parties and the people you met and the places you went to were extraordinary. Um, the school I went to was on the King's Road. So again, there is um, some synergy there. Um, I did go to most of the clubs and the locations mentioned and I did um, live in Paris. Uh, I did live in LA too. And so I did again, see a lot of things, but I did not experience them in the same way as I shall say Phoebe or Paula, who has huge amounts of um, trauma going on in her life, um, those were not me. Oh, okay. Um, have you ever written a book before? I've written lots of self-help books. Um, I still have one out there, which is called um, Discover the New You, Celebrity Stylist Secrets to Transform Your Life and Style, um, which is all about how to be the best version of yourself, color, shape, style, um, positive, positivity, all the things like that. Um, so, and also obviously I'd written in magazines and I had columns, uh, the Express uh, magazine Sunday, I had a column called In the Closet With, which I created, uh, which was for a few years still going. So yes, I have written, but it's very different writing fact to fiction because you have to get into the minds of your characters, um, which is how my story evolved once I realized what the characters might be doing when I got into their mindset. And also, um, I learned a lot on the way because of, of how to do um, dialogue, which is quite hard because you can't keep on the head saying he said, she said. And the, the key 
of apparently that is makes a better book uh, show not tell when you do your descriptions you have to understand and, and create a picture paint a picture with the words not just a description okay and how long does it last on the way how long did it take to write so um, I had a house in the Isle of Wight up till last October, which my view was a swimming pool with palm trees. So um, every summer when I was there, I would sit by the pool and start writing and it evolved and it evolved and I'd put it down and I'd lose interest or lose the will to live really on it. And then during lockdown, oh, and then I had an editor on it <coughs> who I thought I'd finished it. And she went, no, not finished. I, I thought, I can't, I can't do this again. 400 pages, I can't rewrite again. And then during lockdown, when I was really quite ill at the beginning with, who knows, COVID possibly, and I couldn't even concentrate for longer than 15 minutes at a time, 15 minutes at a time, I needed to find something to give me, get me up each day and give me some positivity. And I looked at the book again and thought, maybe. And then I happened by pure serendipity to find an editor who had a moment who said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. So I said, please just read it. Anyway, she fell in love with the book. I said, okay, I will give you homework. So she gave me chapter by chapter homework. And I sat all the way through from probably April till uh, August doing an, a complete rewrite edit on it. And we published it last August. So um, that was my lockdown, which got me up every day and sat and wrote it in the garden. My London so, garden. How did you end up with an agent uh, and a publishing deal now? And it's unusual to get one when you've already published. Absolutely, really unusual. So um, I've been doing my own social media on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. And um, it had got a lot of um, good, it's got some nearly 50, really four and five review, five star reviews on Amazon. And um, I kept on, it's very hard to find an agent because apparently all agents were getting up to 500 submissions a week oh, wow. uh, because everyone's written a novel everyone's written something in lockdown or you know, everyone who'd waited finally has yeah. so all the agents were going no not for us and then suddenly um my old agent who was who was actually for factual books self-help books not fiction so no, why don't you try this agent anyway so this agent i i rang i didn't even email her and she answered the phone well, this is unusual, a person, a human, <laughs> and not an email, especially in these COVID times. So she said, no, too busy. I'm not, not really interested. Why should I be bothered to read your book? So I, so I gave her my sales pitch. I think it's called an elevator pitch in, in, uh, in book speak. And she said, OK, send it over to me and I'll read it. Anyway, so I sent it over and she came back to me five days later saying, I love it. Um, I'm going to look for a publisher for you. I really love it. I think it's a Jackie Collins type uh, of book, which is very timely escapism. And lo and behold, I get a phone call two weeks ago, um, got a proper serious, serious big publisher who's um, bought it. Oh. Contracts are in the middle of saying, so I can't tell you who it is. And is as excited as I am. Ooh. And then the uh, Mail Online picked it as one of the, <laughs> top five raunchy <laughs> spring reads of the spring and then the best <laughs> one of all i'm going to big my blow my own trumpet now so um yesterday um there's a writer called um oh what her name um what's her name fiona walker who's written like 20 books very successfully and she reviewed it so and she wrote there's something fantastically indulgent about reading a rip-roaring, gold-plated, sizzling bonkbuster. And this is no exception. It's full of terrific detail about 70s London, so much so that you can smell the waft of Charlie and MG exhaust fumes long the King's Road. And I enjoyed all the name drops from Chrissy Hine to Jagger. The author certainly knows her stuff about the world of high-class fashion styling, the many details which bring it all to life. Action jets off around the world with satisfying speed, and it's got plenty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll to keep pulses up. The <laughs> set of characters of Paul and Phoebe are written with obvious affection, and their story shows the enduring strength of a teenage friendship forged in adversity on Carnaby Street and in platform heels. The perfect antidote to woke. This is one for Jackie Collins fans everywhere who are missing the glitz. Wow, that's amazing. That. Well done, that girl. That's amazing. Um, are there any tips for would-be writers? Uh, you've got to be really thick-skinned for every single rejection that 
comes back at you. And I, if anyone's ever had homework from school, rejected or rejected and sent back and sent back, it's like that. And you do lose the will to live because you truly, when you finished it and you get to the last page, you think, yes, I've done it. And then you get told, no, back to the drawing board. You really, really need, it's, it's actually a full-time job and yeah, you need yeah. to have your phone switched off no, no uh, emails coming in. In fact, the only way I could write was getting up at 6.30 in the morning and doing it through the morning before I got interruptions because I forgot. And when I had builders here, it was quite awkward writing the really, there are some quite naughty set scenes in it with the builders in the room ask me, where are you, mate? Which, where should we put this plug? And I'm writing some raunchy sex scene. And, and will there be a sequel, Carol? Yeah, there is already um, a sequel synopsisized, and um, I'm ready to um, start writing um, in the next few weeks. It will be a follow-up. Most importantly, where can we buy it? You could buy it on Amazon as a book and also an ebook. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yes, and also um, the bookshop on the Fulham Road. I'm um, forgot what it's called. Don't, have, don't, oh, pardon. Don't, don't book. I no, don't that know. doesn't exist anymore. The one on Fulham Road in Fulham. Um, uh, they did have copies as well, but predominantly Amazon as a, as a book and on Kindle. Okay. Well, Sarah, you've, you've done so well, my darling. You really have, and I'm so we're so excited to hear all about your success. Thank um, so, you. Uh, now I'm going to pass you to Terry, who's going to ask you some questions. So Terry, can I pass you over, please? Hi, Cyril. Um, Hi. A few questions for you. Um, so the first question is, when you were a stylist, uh, you, you talked about um, Zara being a bit difficult. No, no, she was lovely, just in we had of, no time. <laughs> in terms of uh, when you suggest what they, they should wear, um, did they usually take your advice? Um, no, <laughs> you had to give the reason why you were suggesting. And yes, if it was for their public appearances, mostly they would, um, I was being paid to be there either by their publicists or by them. So it'd be stupid to not listen. So yes, on the whole, most people did listen. I actually think private clients probably listen less because they're more set in their ways and less used to paying someone to advise, whereas a celebrity or someone in the public eye is used to being told what to do and being given advice to make them look the best versions of themselves for their brand, for their brand image. Thank you very much. Now, uh, this is a very specific question. Um, so Kenny Everett, and, you know, the, all the stories were that he was a bit zany and unpredictable. Was very. that the case? Say it again. Uh, Kenny Everett was um, reported as being very zany and unpredictable. Uh, was that really the case in real life? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was that However, he was completely what you didn't expect. So I don't know if anyone knows that he was ordained as a priest. Good Lord. <laughs> and um, which was completely <laughs> the, the other thing. Oh, we used to go around to, he lived on um, just off Gloucester Road. And we used to go around to his flat and we used to have sing songs. And he had the most beautiful voice. He used to sing all these um, sort of church, you know, hymns and things as well from his priest days. So not, you're completely two different sides. And it was very sad that he died. He had a very naughty boyfriend, because obviously this was a time in AIDS, that um, I think this is well known. So I'm going to say, allegedly, I think he was supposed to have slept with, his boyfriend slept with Freddie Mercury, who obviously had AIDS, and that's how everything went wrong, I think. Right. That's a great shame, because Freddie and um, Kenny were great friends, weren't they? Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, Veronique Henderson last week gave uh, a fascinating talk on matching your colours. Yes. Does this concept feature into your work as a stylist? Uh, yes, it is. And so um, when I do private clients and um, I, I'm quite, I'm not just colours, I'm very psychological. So my, I always ask my clients three things. I ask them, how do you see yourself? How would you like others to see you? And how would you... Um, how do you see yourself? How would you like others to see you? And how do you think others see you? And the three never match. So I sort of want the three to match. I want people to look in the mirror and like what they see. And so clever dressing is the art of illusion. And dressing, so certain colours flatter your skin tones, others train you. Certain styles flatter your, your shape, 
And so you shouldn't dress specifically for fashion. You can use a nod to fashion and take trends, but you should be dressing for your body shape. And lots of people have wardrobes full of clothes to wear, but actually nothing to wear because when they look at it, they put something on. It's very often the color that drains them. So they feel, oh, I don't, I don't look good in that. Or the shape that isn't working. So it's either making their shoulders look too wide, their hips look too wide, or, you know, it's often things that they didn't understand. And, and, I'd say 75% of both men and women that I've ever worked with over you know, 30, 40 years have a, an element of buying the same repeatedly, the same style, and it, it becomes a bit of a uniform without them realizing. And um, so when I have ladies who get to a certain age and they want to reboot themselves, it's um, quite interesting for someone to look out, you know, think outside the box and see what could tweak and how you could wear your clothes in a different way from things you have already in your wardrobe. I could see uh, Veronique uh, nodding and clapping away there to, the, to your answer. Good. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what, what is next on the horizon? Are you now an author or, or you know, because people have had such interesting career paths on these talks. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, so my agent, this guy said, you say my agent, said, so now you're an author. Are you going to be an author now? So I said, Yes, of course. So yes, there is this next book to write. However, I do still do TV. I love doing radio. That's my most favorite thing. And before COVID, I was every Saturday with Steph and Dom doing um, um, talk radio. So um, that's a shame. That's gone. Um, their show went as well. And then I also still do radio for BBC. Um, I brought on as some sort of guest expert of some sort. Um, I hope that my um, talks to schools and people to help their mental health and body image and understanding um, that you don't have to look perfect, you don't have to be skinny, you don't have to look like all the influencers on Instagram. Um, you can you can be yourself as an individual, and that that makes you beautiful, your own personality and your own confidence shining through. So I'd like to get back to doing that as well. Um, but I do, I still work with clients of all sorts. So you're going to be very busy then? <laughs> uh, well, it would be nice to be busy again, because I'm really sort of, apart from writing the book and having builders for six months, um, I haven't really been working. <laughs> okay, final question. Uh, do you mind being known as a raunchy author? <laughs> <laughs> um, my son won't read the book, because he's... <laughs> fearful of what he might find in it, and I'm his mum. I don't think it is that raunchy because it's not Fifty Shades of Grey. I didn't put the sex bits in for gratuitously. Things happen to the girls. Um, I can't say what because it'll spoil the story and I think I'm not calling it a page turner, but it has been called that. So um, things happen to them which create a girl to do what she has to do. And um, particularly in the case of Paula, and um, basically Paula is very beautiful. She's um, a sort of six foot tall blonde um, who um, has to find ways to live. Um, and um, so maybe some of the sex comes there and, and poor old Phoebe um, goes off the rails. Um, so yes, but it's not a sexy, it's not a sexy book, but it has raunchy bits. It's escapism. I think that's what everybody needs at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Cheryl. I'm going to hand back to Janie now, um, and she'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was so interesting. What an amazing life you've led. If you'd like to buy Cheryl's book, don't forget it's available on Amazon and various other art that she told you about. So please go out and buy it because it's really good read. And all I've got to say to you is good night and keep well. See you next week. Thank you all for coming. Bye.